All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, today's panel. Um, this is uh, titled Competing Visions, Official Discourse versus Localized Practices. And we have three exciting papers. Uh, my name is Rituparna Mitra. Uh, I'm assistant professor of interdisciplinary and post-colonial studies at Emerson College in Boston. And um, I'll be uh, moderating uh, the discussion. Uh, we've had a slight change in the order of presenters today. Um, so I'll, um, you know, I'll be uh, introducing uh, Dr. Giuseppe Sofo, who will be our first presenter, uh, followed by Shivangi and her uh, colleague, uh, Professor Pande, who is going to join us shortly. And uh, finally, we'll have uh, David Mo. Um, so we'll have a uh, roughly 20 minutes per presentation and because Giuseppe will need to leave early um, we will have a short uh, 10 minute uh, discussion after his talk uh, before moving on uh, to Shivangi and David and uh, we'll have a joint discussion at the end um, following the two presentations. All right so um, Giuseppe Sofo is an assistant professor of French language and translation at Ca' Foscari University of Venice. He holds a PhD and a doctor Europaeus from Avignon University and La Sapienza. He has been a fellow of the University Franco-Italian and of DAAD. He has published two books dedicated to translation and rewriting edited a collective work on translation and the 2019 issue of the journal De Generic. He translated theater plays, novels, and poetry from English, French, and German into Italian and from Italian into English. Uh, and these include uh, works by Thoreau, Fuller, Dandicat, Cesar, and others. Um, so Giuseppe, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Ritupana. Thanks, Liam, and thanks, Shivanji, for the last-minute change. I still have uh, problems with uh, with Zoom conferences reminding the the right time zone uh, I'm in and the conference is in. Uh, so really, really sorry about that. But thank you for um, for accommodating my, my my question. So I'll start sharing uh, my presentation, which is about this concept of post-translation city, uh, looking at two cities, uh, L'Aquila and Port-au-Prince, so an Italian city and a nation city. The concept of translational city developed by, uh, by Sherry Simon has taught us to look at cities as spaces of translation uh, shaped by the languages that inhabit uh, the city and and constantly rewritten and and redesigned by its patterns of linguistic interaction, but um, I think we should perhaps speak of post-translational cities uh, following Edwin Gensler's uh, concept of post-translation uh, studies, which invites us to look at the influence that translation and writing have had on the history of of people, cultures, and the spaces they they inhabit. Um, Gensler writes. To measure the success or failure of the ideas or, or the aesthetics of a translation, one has to look beyond, beyond translation and to begin to examine the cultural changes that take place after the translation, hence the move toward the post-translation analysis. What are the changes in poetry and politics, art and architecture, education and the environment, and what role do translations play in effect in these changes? Every, every city has a language of its own, uh, a grammar that rules its, pay, its space, a syntax that coordinates the patterns of social interaction inside this space. And the transformations that um, cities undergo on a, on a constant basis are very similar to the transformation a text undergoes in translation. Um, that's why I, I suggest to, to look at cities through the lens offered by translation studies and through the lens of post-colonial translation studies in particular which have taught us to uh, to look at translation as something which should, which should not be an identical copy of the original, nor an imperfect uh, bad copy, but which could rather also offer us uh, something more than the original itself. Uh, in a work on city and the translation, and especially in the passages on Montreal, uh, Sherry Simon encourages us to see translation in the encounter between different languages as active forces in the transformation of the cities we inhabit. Um, behind this perspective, there is a listening of the city uh, because the audible surface of languages, the signature of dialects and accents specific to each city, 
form an equally essential element of urban reality. And while every city is a site of linguistic encounter, each city imposes its own configurations of interaction. Um, Simon writes about what she defines Ville Traductionnaire, so translational cities. The special character of these cities lies in the presence of two historically rooted linguistic communities which claim a right to the same territory. Each language community is supported by institutions exercising similar authority. The cities are then not bilingual, they are translational. The city is therefore a text to be read, or rather a palimpsest. Um, if it is true that there is something of the palimpsest in, in translation uh, almost every time, because it is a text that is made on top of another text and, and that keeps a trace of, uh, of it. Uh, these double cities, these translational cities are also a palimpsest. Um, in the city, as in any palimpsest, the present and the past coexist in the same space. They interact with each other and they contribute to, to a wider complexity. In studying Simon, um, Sherry Simon's Montreal, I, I ended up with writing and thinking about L'Aquila uh, in Italy and Port-au-Prince in Haiti. Uh, two cities where time and space um, are divided into a before the earthquake and after the earthquake. The connection between L'Aquila and Port-au-Prince was, was drawn uh, by the Asian writer Louis-Philippe d'Alembert, um, who lived both earthquakes and was the first writer ever to dedicate a novel to the earthquake of L'Aquila, um, Balade d'Anamour in Achevé, finding the courage to write what he couldn't write for Haiti, for his own, for his own island. Uh, the earthquake itself is a, is, is a translation that, that shifts meaning, that removes certain certainty. The literary moves the earth and makes it impossible to live um, as it did before. And people who survive an earthquake are somehow inhabited by the same paradox of translation because they are forced to translate themselves, to become something else while, while remaining themselves at the same time. And what is true for people is also true for places. The city is also a living organism which grows and changes while remaining itself. And L'Aquila and port press were, were both translated by the earthquake. And this translation was really a betrayal, uh, but it also had, they also had to be translated, uh, turning a process of passive translation into an active one. Because a city in fragments is a city in, in transition, a place of possibility for the construction of, of a new city. And the patience that, that, um, and the listening that such cities like this require uh, is, is the patience that is required by the understanding of each fragmented identity uh, that composes the city to be able to make of the, the fragmentation of the shattering of the city a way to better grasp the different identities that, that compose it. Um, in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech, uh, Caribbean poet Derek Walcott tells us that uh, when a vase breaks, um, the love that reassembles the fragments is um, stronger than the love that took its symmetry for granted when it was whole. And what these words teach us is that, is that from fragmentation uh, comes not only a rupture, uh, which causes a definitive loss of unity, a defeat, but uh, rather a broader understanding of the whole. Um, and above all, the perception of the energy and of the love that is necessary to, to bring all the different fragments together. Um, a shattered heart is, is a heart in need of love and of hands to work it, to give, uh, to give it to, to it a new unity. And the same metaphor is, is, is offered to us by the, the art, the Japanese art of Kintsuji, uh, which consists in repa repairing broken pottery uh, through the use of gold. Uh, or silver, and which makes the, the object itself more precious, not only in the material sense, because it includes a, a precious uh, material like gold or silver, but also because it's unique and, and it, it bears the traces of the fragmentation of the rupture and, and of the energy and love that we, uh, we invested in it to, to put it back together. And there are different techniques of Kintsugi. In the first picture you see, uh, one case in which you have all the fragments and the gold is only used as a glue uh, spreading along the cracks like blood flow flowing in the veins or, or water that infiltrates between, uh, between the cracks of a dry land to, to restore life. Um, on the other hand, if you have an important piece that is missing, you have two ways uh, that you can use to, to repair the object. And one is that the precious materials of gold in this case can, can be used to fill the void. 
and thus recover something that seemed irretrievably lost. Uh, but you can also decide to incorporate uh, a foreign element, a fragment of another object, uh, completely different from the original. And in this way, something new and expected, and it's the third picture you see, uh, becomes part of the new reconstructed structure, assuming a new value and giving a new value at the same time to what surrounds it. So the fragmentation and the work required to bring the fragments together becomes a value, uh, not a defect, and, and the damage is not hidden, by, by, but emphasized. And in a place like Lacrun, in a place like Port-au-Prince, uh, it is not only fruitful, but perhaps even necessary to move toward an understanding of fragmentation uh, as a value to, and to rediscover the identity and differences inherent in, mm -hmm. in this place before reshaping it to translate it again. Um, to fill the scars and, and, and the cracks with new blood, new roads from, from which we can rethink the city. And there are different ways of, uh, of rewriting, of translating a city. And the most obvious is the reconstruction of the urban space. And each transformation of the city adds level of meaning to an urban palimpsest that is continuously, continuously constructed or reconstructed, never finished, but, uh, but always open. And in L'Aquila, the experience of the Intermedia Video Lab uh, was very important because it, it allows to redesign the city uh, through video mapping using its buildings and, and its gaps, especially as screens. So the project uh, directed by Massimo Fusillo, who's a professor at the university, implies the creation of a laboratory for students who will become the protagonist of the virtual reconstruction uh, and the virtual rethinking of the city. And it is divided in two lines of research. The first one offers a form of virtual reconstruction of Laquilus monuments uh, of the ones that are gone forever. And, um, and it could provide, as Lino points out in this, in this fragment, the technical visual tools to carry out a survey of the Laquila area with the aim of identifying archaeological sites and historical monumental buildings whose philo philological gaps can be filled by a virtual reconstruction projected directly onto the architectural surface in question. So it, it is a virtual reconstruction of the city, filling the gaps that can't be filled on um, anymore by, by real buildings. And the other line of research um, aims at the research of the narrative role that video mapping can play. Uh, in, in both cases, the, the monuments of the city are, are transformed. So the real city and the dream city uh, coexist and feed each other the present and the past. And in order to give life to a new city, um, this this allowed to not only to 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 incorporate the cities that Lacula has been, but also the potential cities it could have been and and was not, and all those possible cities that can be generated by the need to reconstruct, to reinvent, and to redraw a, ge a geographical and, and an emotional map of of the city. Um, when I went back to L'Aquila after the, after the earthquake, uh, 20 years after the, the last time I had been there, I found the city translated. It translated in my mind because my, my childhood memories placed parts of the city in places they had never been in. Um, and translated into the urban geography by, by the earthquake, which still today, uh, more than 10 years later, it's 13 years almost, uh, marks uh, the, the, the path of the city. Um, almost as if the earthquake had never really stopped. Um, and I, reali I realized that my memory had done the same job that, that the earthquake had done. It, it had shattered the city, displaced small and large things, um, and then reassembling these, those fragments in, in, in a disorderly fashion. Um, and it had returned me, to me a, a confused city, a, a city in which it would have been impossible to actually walk. And it made me think of the imaginary cities of Prefet Dufault, the, 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 the Asian painter, of which you just see two, two examples of the uh, dozens that he has drawn. Um, with creating surreal, a surreal urban uh, universe, um, which is the image, the physical reproduction of a vision, a perception, an object whose structure reproduces the intimate look of the painter but which reveals at the same time real concerns uh, for the Asian context. Uh, Dufault's colorful, vertically developed villages defy physics and any urban planning luggage, logic with their absurd and unstable structures. But just as absurd and unstable are sometimes the real villages of, of Haiti, uh, starting from Jalousie, uh, um, a slum that was repainted with Dufault's colors 
which seems to stand on a, on a thin wire suspended in the void and ready to slide downstream at any moment. Uh, the, the slogan that the Asian government used uh, uh, to describe the project through which uh, the Jalous Islam has been repainted was beauty against poverty. Um, the colors, as you can see, is, are, are colors that derive directly from the first painting. So pineapple, lime, mango, papaya, peach, uh, exotic colors. But it is, it's, it's mostly an act of urban cosmetics. Um, which seems, uh, which serves more uh, to the out, to those outside uh, jealousy than to those who live in it. So to those who look up from the luxury hotels of Petionville and see a, ple a place that is more pleasing to the eye, uh, but in which forty five thousand people continue to drink from a single source of drinking water, and continue to challenge a fault line that um, could break the village in two and make it actually slide down. The mountain along with all of the people that inhabit it. So in that case, colors or beauty could hardly save anything uh, because beauty will not say any, save anything or anyone if, if we do not know how to save it um, and, and to save beauty to taking care of it. So Port-au-Prince was, was translated, but here quickly it risks being translated again, but it also had to translate itself, transforming a passive translation, uh, as, as I said before, into an active one. And as I said, a city in fragments, a city in which it is impossible to live as before, is also a translated city, but also a city in transition, not a that city. And the Asian uh, novelist, poet and novelist, uh, Jean Snoel, writes this best about Port-au-Prince when, uh, when he says that he, it flies like a pap, pap, papillon. So papillon is butterfly and pap is Port-au-Prince. It's the, um, the airport code of Port-au-Prince. And this, this three words open the, the novel. And um, when I asked uh, Noel why, he said, well, the, the whole novel was, was in those three words. I could have avoided to, to write the rest, but my publisher would not have been happy about it. And so it transforms the city itself into a butterfly that moves, that flies. Um, and then he says, um, the heart of the city is broken, but it hasn't stopped beating. Uh, broken in the stones, broken in the bricks, bro broken in the ceilings, in the ceilings, broken in the walls. The city's heart is broken. But then he also tells us that despite everything, the city continues to scream. The national palace, the courthouse, the cathedral, not to mention many ministries and official offices, are down. The city is, deca is decapitated, but it still screams with its throat open. Um, a shadow city, once again, is not only the result of a catastrophic event, but also a place of possibilities. This does not mean in any way trying to turn a tragic experience such as the earthquake in Palo Prince into anything that, that is um, far from being something positive, um, which would be completely impossible and disrespectful of, of the many lives broken by that event. But it is rather a matter of grasping the uh, what the possibilities are of going beyond um, the earthquake, not forgetting it at all, but incorporating its scars and into, into the skin of a new city. And in a city like this, new points of reference are established, not only human, but, but also geographical, in a sort of new map of the city that does not completely replace the previous one, but adds to it. Um, in, in another novel by Danila Ferrier, another Asian writer, Tout bouge autour de moi, um, La Ferrier writes, to the reality of this shattered city, people have added elements of the old city that still floats in their memory. Things add up instead of being subtracted. And Lafayette adds that we have to wait for a generation of, uh, of, uh, of people to, who will not have known the old city before we can accept the new map. But I believe that in reality, not even the generational passage is, is, is sufficient to erase the presence of the old city in the new city. Um, every city contains others. Uh, the cities it has been and uh, that have left more or less marked imprints in it as as Salvatore Settis has written. So the translation of the city can turn into a possibility because as Simon writes, by the very fact of its existence, translation adds levels of meaning and it adds layers of meaning to the original, just like a translation does for a text. And every transformation of the city adds layers of meanings to an urban palimpsest that is continually being constructed and reconstructed that is never finished and always open as I as I said before. And indeed the city is, is always a palimpsest in which the texture of the city survives by changing, replacing, 
some buildings and preserving others with the same or different in, intended use. Uh, there are cities like that that, that are very um, beautiful examples of this. And one is Venice. Um, uh, Venice is exactly the same city that it was five centuries ago in the fact that um, it hasn't moved and it can't move, but it's always different because it's always rebuilt in, in, in the inside. And the, the, the very platforms it relies on to, to not uh, uh, slide into water are rebuilt constantly. So it's the same, but changing. Um, it's, it's this paradox of, of being always the same and always something new. And the distance between the, the real city and the dream city is basically the same as the one that Laferriere uh, once again tells us about in his Pays Sans Chapeau, another novel, in which he writes about a nation painter that is uh, inspired by the figure of, of Prefet Dufault, about whom I spoke before, who decides to paint green, lush landscapes and smiling people, even though it's surrounded by misery and, and, and desolation. And it's the painter himself who explains the reason uh, for this choice when he's asked. So uh, somebody asked him, why do you always paint very green, very rich landscapes, trees bursting with heavy wipe through smiling people, while all around you there is misery and desolation? There is a moment of silence. And, and then he answers, what I paint is the country I dream of. And the other question, and the real country? Well, the real country, sir, I don't need to dream it. So the real city, once again, dream city coexist. They feed off each other. Uh, giving rise to creative dissonance and friction, which can lead to more productive channels of exchange. And, and the same is true for the different urban and artistic languages that meet in the city and through their dialogue, build a more productive exchange, a third language of encounter that helps us to, to, to tell a more complex city, uh, which includes in itself every meaning that has been given to it, every fracture and every scar, but also all the work done by those who inhabit it uh, to make it into a new space. So the city becomes, as another uh, Asian poet uh, says, Frank Etienne, a faux de paradox, a jeu de metaphors, a, a fire of paradoxes, a, a play of metaphors. And, but these are metaphors and paradoxes that multiply the usability of the city and make it open to different interpretations and to different ways of, of experiencing it. So in order to, to see cities uh, like Lacula and port au prince be reborn, I think we, we will have to be able to grasp and recompose the fragments of all the cities that build and reconstructed and, and also incorporating all the potential cities that these cities could have been and were not. And all those possible or impossible cities that can be generated by this need to reconstruct, to reinvent, to redraw a, a map are the possibilities that open up in a, in a city like port au prince to, to need to reconstruct itself and, and find new languages to tell a, a new story about the city. And to recompose the, to recombine the elements uh, in a different way and to make sure that all the languages that inhabit it can meet and even clash uh, to, to give life to, to a third space, to a third language, to an unprecedented and unforeseen uh, city that lives on the contact and friction, friction between the city of the past and the city of the future, between the real city and the dream city. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And that was perfect timing as well. Thanks. Um... <laughs> I'm sorry if I went too fast, but I'm always uh, afraid of running to... Long. All right. Um, so we're going to uh, have a Q&A session with Giuseppe now. Um, and uh, I don't see any questions in the chat, but OK. Yep, David. Uh, sure. So first of all, uh, great top talk. I, th I thought it was very, very interesting. Um, needless to say, as um, a person who works primarily on things French, who has um, transitioned into the uh, Italian world. I'm very happy to see someone who's followed uh, the opposite trajectory. It's always nice to <laughs> cross paths that way. Um, but one thing that uh, occurred to me from my more 19th century perspective is, you know, first of all, a partially different set of 
theoretical literature, but also a different set of concerns that are somehow still related to what you were discussing. So, I mean, the first thing that I thought about, um, you know, in your talk when you were posing this distinction between the real city and the sort of dream city is that, um, you know, in many ways, for example, people like Walter Benjamin uh, in writing about, you know, urban modernity in the 1800s made the argument that it was precisely characterized not by the distinction between these two things, the, the, the real and the dream, but Benjamin very, you know, famously and eloquently refers to the sort of modern city as phantasmagoria rendered in stone. Um, and uh, so I was wondering, you know, if you had any reflections on that idea, um, this relationship of, uh, you know, fragmentation the, and the blending of the real and the imaginary uh, and, its, and its relationship to something that could vaguely be understood as modernity. Um, and the, the, the second point is that, of course, for Benjamin, you know, if you think in terms of translation, the thing that is being translated for him in the modern city is uh, a combination, you know, twofold, uh, radical change, uh, capitalism, certainly, but uh, capitalism that's also related to the, you know, revolutionary unrest uh, that was sweeping uh, Europe in the 1800s, a revolutionary unrest that is often likened uh, metaphorically to natural disasters, uh, mm -hmm. like volcanoes, for instance, is a very common uh, kind of geographical metaphor that is used to describe revolution during that earlier period, uh, seismic activity, lightning storms, these, these, these sorts of things. And so um, I couldn't help but pick up on, you know, the, the, the sort of earlier resonances of, of what you were describing in this much more modern 21st century context. Yeah, <laughs> I think I, I probably need uh, a couple of days to, to 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 answer your question. But thanks because that's that's really interesting. I think you, yeah, the, the this this distinction between the, the the real city and the dream city, it's certainly not new. And um, but um, but but I agree with you. I think that the, the interesting thing is is where the two merge and where when the imaginary of of the dream city and the, the imaginaries of the different cities that a city has been can merge to collaborate to um to create something new i'll, I'll tell you where i started from um it's i i, I taught in l'aquila for 10 years so i went I went there all the time and there is really this distinction bef between before the earthquake and after the earthquake and the 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 narration is well nothing can be as it was before you know nothing can ever be as it was before we lost our city our city is gone and and uh, i almost you know almost as, as a play what i started to tell them well you know it was it was uh, I, I taught translation there and i had um i, I had students who, who told me these things so it was really i saw i saw students really live in the city and then coming back and being like, yes, but it's never like before. And then I, 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 I started discussing with them this, these things about theory of translation because I was, yeah, but what we read when we read translation theory is that it doesn't need to be as before. And it was, it was kind of a, pro, a little provocation, but then I realized that it, 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 it kind of included a more uh, um, uh, a wider possibility of seeing that um, you really don't have to only to think of the, the gone, you know, the, the past that is gone, but really about the opportunity of, of building something new with it. And this this laboratory that I very briefly uh, spoke about was interesting in that sense because it was the students who uh, decided the gaps that had to be filled in the city. Um, and it was not the most important ones. So I, um, it was meant to be monuments, but at some point they, uh, they, they decided that a certain bar that was there and was not there anymore had to be reconstructed because it was for them a point of reference in the city that they had lost. So this idea that um, it's, it's you and it's finally you that can really actively reconstruct the city and and you do it with the with an imaginary of the past without this the without letting this imaginary of the past haunt you, uh, in the sense that it doesn't you know it doesn't have to be over overwhelming over uh, over the city over the present city and over the present uh, or the city of the future. And then this this uh, this idea of translation con this connection between 
um, translation, natural disasters and change. I have to say that a lot of this comes also from the fact that I, I, I've written a lot about the Caribbean and about Caribbean thought. And I'm more and more convinced, especially reading Glissant, translating Glissant, working on his, on, his, um, on his writing, that there is a deep connection between the, let's say, openness and fragmentation and openness to fragmentation of Caribbean thought and natural disasters. Uh, you live in an area that is always touched and menaced by natural disasters. Um, I was lucky enough to, to spend a night in, in Glissant's house uh, at, at, or at Diamant uh, because um, the, the, house the house still exists and I was invited once and uh, I couldn't sleep a second because you have the, the, the sea that comes really up to you. Uh, really, it's, it's two meters um, lower than the house and you, you hear it and you feel like you're in, open, in the open sea and that a storm is taking you and that you're going to you know, be submerged by water uh, every second. And then I realized that he writes about this a lot of times. And he writes about this thing, about this, this constant menace of the natural disasters as something that makes you more open to diversity, more open to fragmentation, and more open to creating something new from scratch. Because uh, technically, it is what you have to do in such a, in such, in such a place many times um so i'm not sure you know really it really um it really answers uh w w what you said about benjamin but i think there is a connection mm -hmm. in, in 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 the way i i see the, this this uh, theoretical frame of translation and caribbean thought uh really as a form of you know seeing change as something that is uh, and variation is something that is the only thing that's actually static. It's the only thing that's over-present, that it's always present is change. So I'm sorry, I'm not sure I answered, but- No, 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 it's perfect. And I'll, I'll just say that it, it's great that you ended on Haiti because that's in many ways a natural place to blend the sort of metaphor of revolution and the metaphor right. of natural <laughs> disaster. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Unfortunately, yeah. Thank you, thank you, David. We might have time for another short question. Yeah, Shivangi. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. Uh, so I'll continue with this idea uh, that uh, you, you discussed uh, about the real city and the imagined city. So you mentioned that real city and imagined city often feed each other. And you also discussed this example of the painting and then you uh, showed a picture of uh, slum redevelopment. So I was reminded of this idea. So this is more of a comment than a question. I was reminded of this idea uh, of Henry Leffer in the production of space where he talks about the representational space, represented space and the lived space. Mm -hmm. So how there's always an interaction of the uh, representational space and the lived space, and especially when talks about the artistic spaces. So the idea of the image, um, the painting that you show the fictional city and then the colorful picture of the slum area. So how the two ideas always feed it, eat each other in the daily life of the people. Yeah, thanks. And, and it's, of course, it's a book that is, you know, a huge reference in, in, in my work that I really appreciate. I, I don't know why I did a quote him this time because it's, it's really a reference that I, that I was even too often. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy to see how you, you, you paint a city that does not exist and then the city you are painting and then imagine the new city becomes what you had painted you know um, and it's 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 clear example but these things happen um a lot um and so it's it was yeah thanks thanks for the comment it was really it's really connected uh, uh dr sofo uh, i really enjoyed uh, your uh, your talk but there's one thing you talked about the imaginary city and the real city cities of the past and cities of the future what about the cities eternal hmm. There have been some some places which which have not changed so fast. I come from Varanasi. Eh? The cities. Uh, uh, I, I what, what about the cities? Cities eternal. Hmm. Though, well, although the phrase has been used in uh, in the other other sense. Eh? Uh, well, I, I'm, Saint Augustine I'm used from... that C city eternal city. But when we look at a city like Varanasi, eh? uh, 
uh, uh, Dr. Mook talked about uh, the kind of danger uh, in which the cities have been disrupted again and again and uh, new ways of creation. And on the other hand, there is a city like Varanasi. So and I, I uh, know. we know it, ha it has never been destroyed. Yeah. I don't the know life has been slow comparatively. Yeah, yeah. it has been slow. Hmm. Uh, the Ganges changes its course there. Yeah. Throughout uh, its course from the Himalayas to the, uh, to the Indian Ocean, it moves from north to south. But in Varanasi, it changes the course and it becomes slow. And it has been a center of music, uh, music and dance and classical, uh, classical, uh, classical literature and classical dance. Yeah, just something to add to what you said. Uh, yes, it reminded I, me of. Yeah, I, I don't know Varanasi, but if you if you yeah. if you talk about eternal cities, I'm I'm, I'm speaking yeah. from Rome, so that that yeah. could add yeah. to the the list of eternal cities probably. Yeah, but but this you know being eternal does not make it uh, less subject to change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, one that, of the problems true. of Rome is yeah. that it doesn't yeah. change enough. Yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, the same with Varanasi. It doesn't change fast, even if people have tried to change it. Rename but, it, naming, renaming. And but you know, so many names and the city went on accepting all those names. But, you know, even if it doesn't change, the fact of yeah. not changing changes the city as, yeah. uh, anyway, because you're not changing, but the world around you is changing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it changes it change. the perspective on the city. Uh, yeah. it's kind it's kind of like the kintsuji piece i i should yeah, it be, can be, it can be. You, yeah. you're the same but then everything yeah. else changes so so you yeah. become something else yeah. you know yeah, a yeah, city yeah, that yeah. cannot change will probably yeah. become something like a tourist attraction rather yeah. than a city so that's yeah. the, probably the most extreme form yeah. of mm -hmm. transformation yeah fascinating stuff uh we'll have to i'm sorry and thanks stop a lot the sorry here yeah. so that thanks a lot uh, again. the others can uh but yeah, uh, absolutely fascinating. And uh, I, I had a question about the archipelagic thought, but you kind of answered it when you brought we'll, up. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about yeah. it. <laughs> Thanks All a right. lot. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So um, we're moving on to our next speakers. Um, professor K.M. Pandey is a professor at Department of English at Banaras Hindu University. Uh, his specialization is in 18th century British poetry. Sanskrit poetics and Indian English literature. And we have uh, Shivangi Chaturvedi, who is a PhD research scholar at the Department of English at the same university, uh, PHU. She has done her master's and bachelor's in English from uh, University of Delhi, India. And um, yeah, take it away. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Mitra, for the introduction and thanks to the organizers for uh, giving us this opportunity to present my paper. Uh, the topic of my presentation is Delhi, un Delhi, the contestation of survival between the city and its people. And before I start with my presentation, there, is a few, uh, there, there are a few clarifications related with the geographical uh, names that I'll be using in the presentation. So first of all, the official name of Delhi is the NCT of Delhi, National, Cap uh, National Capital Territory of Delhi. And New Delhi is a district within the NCT of Delhi and uh, is the capital of India. And the old Delhi or Shah Jahanabad that I'll be referring to in my paper is a small area within Delhi. And it was a walled city that was established in 1639. So I'll start with the official, uh, I'll start with the description of Delhi that is given on the official website of Delhi Tourism. I quote, on the site where Delhi stands today, several cities have risen and decayed in the past. Their relics are visible symbols of the Delhi's glorious past. After independence, Delhi became the capital of new nation. With the advent of independence, its importance has increased many fold and Delhi has now become the political, economic and culture capital of country. Another description is given uh, in, of, uh, another description of Delhi is given in the novel, The White Tiger by Edgar. And I quote, the capital of a glorious nation, the seat of parliament of the president of all the ministers and prime minister, the pride of our civic planning, the showcase of Republic, that's what they call it. Let a driver tr tell you the truth. And the truth is that Delhi is a crazy city. A brief description of Delhi and the of a brief description of Delhi on the official Delhi tourism website of the government of NCT of Delhi presents a compact picture of city that has seen a succession of changes and has always regenerated itself. This presents an impressive story from the point of view of the city. What is missing from the picture is the voices and the perspective of its people. 
in the decays and the rapid transformation that have taken place, what remains inconspicuous is how its inhabitants have adjusted and responded to them. The grand narrative of the transformation of city into a mega city does not hold true for its population of more than 16 million people. As the protagonist from the novel, The White Tiger mentions the distinction that it is they who have the glorious story of the city. They who hold the power and either politically or economically. But the rest of the common people, like the working and economically lower section of the society, it is tough to find a silver lining in the life that city offers. This paper analyzes the city of Delhi from the perspective of the characters who represent the common people from three fictional novels set in different socio, cultural and political periods. The selected novels are Twilight in Delhi, The White Tiger and The Ministry of Utmost Happiness. The focus is on how its inhabitants create spaces of survival by contesting different forces that direct and drive the city. These forces are defined by the politics of the ruling class and the economically rich class that have the power invested in them. Despite the difficult circumstances created by the political, social, and economic environment, the characters find and construct their own space where they can belong. These spaces are not uniform and fixed. They are strife with problems, conflicts, and past struggles. The realism present in, the no in three novels allows the readers to look this at the city as experienced by the characters. The characters are analyzed, that are analyzed are the subjects that bear the intentional or coincidental impact of the economic forces and political events that unfold in the city. The narratives are not presented through the city eyes and deal with the varied nature of problems and the issues that city offers to its inhabitants. The term city eyes is used by Salman Rushdie in the novel Midnight Children, where he uses this, this uh, concept to express this idea, the, the condition in people uh, that hides away all the elements that do not fit into the idealistic representation of the city. Coming to the first novel, Twilight in Delhi by Ahmed Ali is set during the period when British Empire shifted its capital in India from Calcutta to Delhi in 1911. It covers the years from 1911 to 1919 that include the World War I and several events pertaining to Indian freedom struggles. The novel focuses on the life of the two principal characters, Mil Mir Nihar and his son Asghar. Ali describes the city of Shah Jahanabad or Old Delhi as if being in a state of slumber yet alive. Before the coronation of George V in 1911, it had its own rhythm. Changes started appearing in the city with the preparations for the coronation, which turned the areas near the Old Delhi into an exhibition ground. In the novel, the inhabitants of Old Delhi take pride in their, in their historical legitimacy of being its residents. It was their people, the Muslims, who were the rulers before the British dethroned them. The nostalgia in their past gets reaffirmed with the new presence of the British in Delhi. The crimes that British rulers committed against the natives in Delhi during the first war of independence in 1857 made people wary of their new presence in their city. Despite being their city for the residents like Mir Nihal, it slowly became uncanny. From the physical structures to the socio-cultural fabric of the city, everything changed due to the arrival of the British. With the structural changes like the demolitions of the city walls of the old Delhi, their city slowly changed beyond recognition. The First World War led to the price inflation of grains that affected the economy. The culture of pigeon keeping and pigeon flying slowly died away because the grains that were used to feed the pigeon, pigeons became costly. With the rise of freedom movements, the marketplace that was once the place of socialization for local, locals lost its nature because the English soldiers started frequenting them. Contrary to the way Mir Nihal reacts to the dying of the culture and the changing environment is the deliberate reshaping of his son Asghar's lifestyle. Despite the lack of approval of his father and the disdain of elderlies in his community, Asghar tries to adopt the new ruler's way of life. He incorporates English fashion in the, matter, in the manner he dresses from using the leather shoes to the bathrobes. In terms of the lifestyle changes, he moves out of his father's house into an independent house that he shares with his wife and starts using English furnitures like a uh, table and sofas that were originally not part of his culture. A post-colonial reading of Asghar's action, his adoption of the lifestyle of the rulers, transforms him into Homi K. Baba's ambivalent subject where he is mimicking the colonizer. 
with the mimicking of the aesthetics of the powerful group, that is the fashion and the lifestyle of the colonizers by the colonial subject, it can also be seen as Asghar's way of belonging into the new socio-cultural environment created by the new rulers. D. Asher Gertner, in his seminal work, Rule by Aesthetics, presents a study of the transformation of millennial Delhi a world as a world-class city in terms of its effect on the inhabitants belonging to the lower social classes. He uses the case study of the residents of slum settlement called Shiv Camp. Due to the planning and the implementation of the world-class aesthetics in Delhi, in 2007, parts of Shiv Camp were forcefully demolished by the authorities and the residents were resettled into a different location at the outskirts of Delhi. Gartner finds peculiar reasoning amongst the residents in their understanding of the situation. If at one level the residents fight for their right to belong in the city, observes Gartner, due to, and, and I quote, due to the deep normalization of the world-class aesthetics, unquote, of how a city should be, at another level they are conditioned to believe that their slums do not hold the legitimacy in the new emerging city. In the statement of one of the residents, Motilal, and I quote, Jukis, which is a name for a slum settlement, are out of place. I recognize the terms of sensibility I am to engage in the current context." Unquote. Gertner finds that instead of showing simple conformance to the structural power, Motilal is also trying to find a social legitimacy in the system. In the House of the Slum Residence, Gertner often finds posters belonging to a trope that depicts a bungalow, that is a private house, along with a garden, where the rich and the elite people live. For the residents, the image depicts the idea of proper homes that belong to a place envisioned by the authorities. These houses are part of the big life that, according to them, entails world-class living standard. In the face of demolitions and losing one's home, the visuals of the private property provide registers through which, the, through which they can find hope and possibility in the idea that we too should become big. A certain level of similarity can be drawn in the way Asghar from Twilight tries to adopt the sensibilities of English lifestyle and the new meanings that residents of some uh, of Shiv camp incorporate into the visuals of a house that embodies better living conditions and validity of habitation. To clarify, the socio-political context and the historical situations are entirely different in, the bo in both scenarios, but there is a semblance in the way the powerful group that rule, control, manage, and manage the citizen and spaces in the city, the colonizers in the novel Twilight, and the local administration of Delhi from Gertner's work, make powerless citizens question their belonging to the city that historically has been theirs. The response of the subject through the appropriation of the aesthetics and cultural norms show their resistance and resolution for a claim of legitimacy in the new standards set by the powerful groups. Coming to the next novel, The White Tiger. The White Tiger by Arvind Adiga is set during the time of economic prosperity in India in 1991. It presents a dark satire on the life and the values in the society that saw extreme socio-economic disparity among the people. The protagonist, Balram Halwai, presents his life story of how he moves from his village to the city, kills his employer, and later becomes a business owner. He presents his journey through the cities of Dhanbad, Delhi, and Bangalore. The focus of the paper is restricted, restricted to his life in Delhi. The novel presents two faces of Delhi, the capital-driven and power nexus state in which the rich and politically affluent groups live, and the other that looks like a rooster coop. It, it is the first group that controls the city. Balram uses the analogy of rooster coop to show the existence of the second group of people, the homeless, poor, lower working class, like servants, watchmen, and drivers, who live their lives like chickens caged tightly into coops. They know that they will soon meet their end, but continue to live the same lifestyle as they are powerless to make any changes. For Balram, Delhi, despite being a crazy city, is a source of light compared to the darkness of small towns, villages, and cities. The poor and the lower working class people who migrate to the city for a source of income and better life still have to struggle for daily survival. Due to the heavy influx of migrants in the capital resulting from the partition of India and the economic opportunity, uh, the intention of the Intention of the modern Delhi's first master plan that was made in 1962 was to deflect the migrant population away from the New Delhi. The new versions of development plan continue to overlook the inclusion of the migrants into the planning of the state. As Sain Gupta observes in Delhi Metropolitan, 
I quote, to this day, planners have failed to make provisions for the fact that poor migrants in search of a livelihood will inevitably be drawn to Delhi in the absence of any other means of survival in their native place, unquote. Balram comments on the lifestyle of the migrants, migrant workers that they, I quote, come from darkness to Delhi to find light, but they, but they were still in the darkness in Delhi, unquote. The character of Balram is quite perceptive of the system of the city and the opportunities it, it offers. He's aware of the fact that the same Delhi for the rich and poor are two separate cities. Even the rules and the laws are there only for the poor to keep them in check. For the upper class people, these remains pointless. His employer, Mukesh, who bribes politician and police in order to receive favor from them, often ran, reminds Balram to be wary of the law and the police. In one of the scenes where Mukesh gives bribe gives a bribe worth thousands of millions of rupees to the politician, later nags Balram and calls him a corrupt servant for the one rupee coin that he supposedly lost in the car. Right from the beginning of the novel, the character of Balram can be seen as, a sh as sharp and opportunist, but the environment that Balram encounters in Delhi allows him to hone his shrewdness. Due to the level of the corruption and the social and moral decay the city provides, it becomes difficult to judge Balram's act of killing his employer. Instead, his unlawful act of murder becomes a key for him to free himself from the rooster coop of the city. Coming to the last novel, The Ministry of Utmost Happiness by Arundhati Roy presents an intricately woven plot revolving around different characters whose lives get shaped by major political events in the 21st century India. It covers a range of political events and issues in India, but the focus of the paper is limited to Delhi. Delhi is often seen as a palimpsest city where the traces of the past continue to exist with the present. In the novel, this bond between the living and the dead get manifested into a tangible reality when Anjum, one of the central characters, builds a house named as Jannat Guest House in a graveyard. In Jannat, every dweller co-inhabits with a grave that has become part of the room interior. Anjum's Jannat Guest House is a, uh, becomes a connecting field for most of the characters in the novel. Anjum, who is a resident of the Old Delhi, is an intersex person who belongs to a socially outcast community of transgenders. Her guest house provides a space to the people who belong to the disposed of communities and have suffered maltreatment from the exploitative orders of the society. She manages to handle the police notice of unlawful squatting by bribing them with small amounts of money and food. The first resident of the guest house is Dayachand, who belongs to a Dalit community the lowest caste in Indian society. After his father gets brutally lynched by a mob on the Delhi Gurgaon highway, due to the corrupt and Machiavellian police and religious intolerance in society, he changes his name to Saddam Hussain. His experience of working as a guard at, in an art exhibition in the National Gallery of Modern Art in New Delhi left him visually impaired. Ironically, his vision got compromised due to his job of safekeeping an artwork, a giant steel tree that was meant as a spectacle for the visitors. The steel tree was kept in open and the harsh sun rays reflecting from its surface damaged his eyes. His request to let him wear dark glasses gets completely disregarded by the gallery authorities. Instead, he gets fired from his job. The attitude of the organizers and the employers, those who belong to the upper class, shows the value and significance given to the life of the people working in the lower sections of the society. The planning, uh, the planning department of Delhi in its 2017 and 18 economic survey describes the state as, I quote, a prosperous state with the second highest per capita income in Delhi, unquote. Yet one third of the population lives in substandard housing. Gardner has noted that the property ownership became the primary foundation on which the political belonging was recognized in millennial Delhi. Jannat Guest House, a house constructed by a social outcast that resides and connects other kinds of outcasts and disposes people in the society, provides a space of resistance against the powerful groups. This act of building and owning a house is an important step in asserting their existence in a society that does not provide space for their survival and growth. Rituparna Mitra in the paper titled Precarious Dunya identifies the development of provisional communities like that of Anjum's Jannat Guest House as a space where people of the oppressed groups assert claims over their lives and their future. The life of that, the life that of inhabitants of Jannat Guest House des that design for themselves shows that the falling people do not reduce themselves as passive subjects of the state and social oppressions. 
the reclamation of their lives shows their resilience to not only survive but also belong in a place rana das gupta in his non fictional writing capital a portrayal of 21st century delhi presents a sociological study of modern delhi for das gupta delhi and i quote is a segregated city a city of hierarchies and clannish allegiances it has no truly democratic space unquote the burgeoning experience of the city is enjoyed by the delhi's elite the rich who are part of the economic prosperity of the city and can rely on the direct political backing or indirect support of political and bureaucratic machinery the rich in delhi often have the social network of connections that support each other and are well aware of the government system in which they operate the majority of the city population the lower working class people are not part of their world in delhi the growth of industries and infrastructural development has led to the influx of large number of poor migrant workers from the states of uttar pradesh and bihar the rich in delhi and i quote from das gupta owe much of their prosperity indeed to the fact that they are they were situated in the middle of an ocean of poverty unquote yet their world do not take into account of the people who labored to build it in the book capital one of the people who looks after the residents of a slum resettlement colony informs the author and i quote you cannot run a city if you live in a mansion a city is run by people who live in huts and slums rickshaw drivers vegetable vendors cobblers construction workers and other working people unquote but the delhi government in order to make the city look planned and beautiful forced out the poor workers from the yamuna settlement that was inside delhi into the undeveloped outskirts areas of the delhi the delhi of the novel the twilight is shaped and ruled by the british they were the colonizers who through their who through their gentrifying administrative practices divided the city even after the independence of the country the pattern of difference within the life of inhabitant inhabitants continues in the city as depicted in the white tiger and the ministry the binary of the colonizer and the colonized merely transforms into new binaries based on economic and class segregation of its inhabitants the selected novels open up spaces of contestation that delhi creates for its socio economically weaker classes despite the skewed growth and planning of delhi the stories of inhabitants provide a counter narrative of survival amidst the meta narrative of the city's survival transformation and growth thank you but thank you that was a, a very well crafted reading of uh, three of uh, my favorite novels actually so um and i hope we'll come back for a good discussion um we now uh, move to our third and final speaker uh, david moke who is a lecturer at the university of california santa barbara he received his phd in french history from princeton university in 2017 and his presentation today is drawn from his dissertation which studies the origins and development of tourism in nice uh, in the year 1760 between the years 1760 and 1860 thank you very much uh for that introduction and uh thank you to my fellow presenters i've i've thoroughly enjoyed your talks um briefly i will be doing my uh talk a little bit old school i will share my screen at certain moments to show you uh, a couple of figures but otherwise um i won't have a powerpoint presentation and i can't help but preface what i'm going to talk about um by you know making connections with what i've just heard a uh, tourism may seem as though it is you know to a certain extent unrelated to the sorts of things that were just being discussed uh but in many ways what you'll see uh, i hope is that the story of tourism in nice in the early 1800s is in many way a many ways a colonial and post colonial story Uh, as many scholars have pointed out there is a very close semblance resemblance between uh the tourist gaze and the colonial gaze uh, when they're sort of directed at populations that are being occupied by outsiders and of course um you know this brings about fragmentation in the city of nice and with fragmentation you have translation contested translations contested visions of uh, nice past present and future and in many ways that is the topic of my talk today so i i i do hope uh you enjoy it 
So that being said, I will jump on in and begin. So the first thing I want to uh, do is tell you a story. And this is a story that begins in August of 1852 with a notary and a court clerk by the name of Eugenio Emanuel, who published a pamphlet entitled simply Il Quindici di Agosto in Nizza, which means the 15th of August in Nice. Now, Nice at this time in 1852 was a city that lay on the border between France and what would soon become the Kingdom of Italy. And it was one of the birthplaces of tourism as a modern uh, industry. Now, this pamphlet, Il Quindici di Agosto in Nizza, began by reassuring readers that while it was common for other people to exaggerate events that brought fame and fortune to their cities, this was not true of the Niçois who uh, Eugenio Emmanuel claimed could celebrate a historical patrimony that was honestly without rival. Despite this incomparable source of riches, however, locals, the Niçois, were negligent when it came to their past. Some attributed this neglect to a mere lack of interest, but Emmanuel saw something far more sinister in the works. He saw a conscious effort to forget that was motivated by political and economic engagements. Nothing less could be expected from a generation, uh, according to Emmanuel, that, quote, lived among foreigners. Now, who these nefarious foreigners were remained unclear, and this is not surprising since Emmanuel was not looking to assign blame. Uh, rather, he wished to communicate a message of hope. He believed that locals, even those most, quote, seduced by foreign caresses, could be taught to love their past once more, provided they were encouraged by municipal officials. And toward that end, he suggested that the city celebrate the upcoming, the, the, the upcoming uh, 300th anniversary of a local chapel known as the Sincare Chapel, which had been consecrated to the Virgin Mary on the 15th of August, 1552. But why was this particular anniversary suited to the political and ideological re-education of the Niçois, according to Emmanuel? Well, Emmanuel attempted to answer that question through an extended historical essay. Interestingly enough, the consecration of the Sincare Chapel occupied only a small part of his narrative. Most of his time and energy was in fact dedicated to describing a series of events that had taken place nine years earlier, not in 1552, but in 1543. And in particular, uh, Emmanuel focused on a climactic battle that occurred on the 15th of August, 1543, which one suspects was the actual object of his commemorative ambitions. This battle took place during one of the many Italian wars that pitted the King of France, uh, Francois I, against the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. It began when French forces crossed the river Var, which at that time was the border between Provence, a French territory, and the Kingdom of Savoy, a territory that would in the future become part of Italy. Now the French invaders in crossing the river Var were supported in their endeavor by their ally, the Ottoman Empire, which had sent a naval force under the infamous uh, Admiral Haradine Barbarossa. Now, according to the traditional story, the city and chateau of Nice, upon being uh, invaded and attacked uh, by the French and the Turks, refused to surrender, and they were subsequently besieged by land and from sea. After several weeks of bombardment, a breach had been opened in the town walls close to a tower known as Sincare. The French and Ottoman forces poured into the city and sent the local troops into a panic. The Ottoman crescent had been planted on the ruined town walls as a sign of victory. Yet at the last moment, a woman of the people, a quote woman of the people named Catherine Seguren rushed into the breach screaming Viva Savoya. She fought off several soldiers, seized the Ottoman crescent and rallied the local troops who fell upon their French and Turkish enemies with renewed fervor. It was this battle and this quote, woman of the people that Emmanuel wished to commemorate. Catherine Seguren was the very embodiment of the loyal and courageous commoners that he believed the Niçois to be, even if they had been led astray in recent years. Her actions also had something divine about them. A lowly woman who protected Christians against the predations of Muslims could not fail to conjure up images of the Virgin Mary in Europe. 
This association was even more pronounced since the battle took place on the Feast of the Assumption, August the 15th, uh, which is a holiday dedicated to the Virgin Mary. And Emmanuel certainly did nothing to discourage this association either. He referred to Catherine Seguren as, quote, divinely inspired and claimed that, quote, the queen of the heavens had moved her arm. What is more, he cited a number of sources that reported apparitions of the Virgin Mary during the battle itself. In his opinion, Catherine Seguren should be celebrated because she represented a monarchical and a religious worldview that was uncorrupted by the uh, as yet unnamed foreign influences that he found so troubling in his own day and age. That Catherine Segerin was the actual object of Emmanuel's commemorative ambitions is borne out by celebrations, uh, the celebrations that occurred on the 300th anniversary uh, of the Sincare Chapel that occurred on the 15th of August, 1852. Uh, two days before the festivities were to commence, the mayor of Nice issued a proclamation in which he urged his fellow citizens to participate in the anniversary, quote, of the day when Nice was delivered from the Gallo Turks by the arm of a Niçois woman, Catherine Seguren, end quote. The city council had also voted a subsidy for the Society of the Holy Sepulchre, which was tasked with making sure that the festivities were both splendid and solemn. And needless to say, according to Emmanuel, the author of our pamphlet, these celebrations were a resounding success. The people showed up en masse, and by far the most popular attraction was an elaborate fireworks show staged close to where the battle was supposed to have taken place. It was accompanied by the illumination of a transparency that projected an image, quote, of our heroine Segurena in the act of ripping the flag from the enemy standard bearer. The crowds went wild for this patriotic spectacle. Their actions seemed to confirm the belief of municipal officials that the people were animated by a love of their patria, which ensured, quote, such a national solemnity would always be celebrated with pomp, end quote. Yet upon closer inspection, it becomes clear that things did not proceed as smoothly as Emmanuel and the city council would have us believe. There was considerable contestation. An opposition newspaper uh, called L'Avenir de Nice, The Future of Nice, led the charge when it mocked the mayor for claiming that the 15th of August, 1852, marked the 300th anniversary of the battle in question, instead of the more accurate 15th of August, 1843, nine years earlier. It then reminded its readers that the city, that the city of Nice ultimately capitulated to the invading forces even if the chateau managed to hold out until reinforcements arrived. It acknowledged that the French and Ottomans were allied in the assault on Nice, but asserted that it was actually a combined Tuscan and Ottoman force that stormed the breach in the town walls. They were indeed fended off, but not by a quote, woman of the people. It would seem that troops had been dispatched from the chateau. Uh, and in terms of uh, battles uh, in that day and age, this was a fairly typical one. Nothing miraculous occurred. Nobody named Catherine Seguren participated in the fighting. She probably never existed to begin with, according to L'Avenir de Nice. As for the festivities, they were not welcomed with unanimous enthusiasm. The editors at L'Avenir de Nice presented them as a strictly partisan affair. The festivities were ridiculed for their superstitious priestcraft with those penitential confraternities like the Society of the Holy Sepulchre coming in for especially fierce criticism. It was insinuated that the entire commemoration had been orchestrated with clerical motives in mind, since Emmanuel, the author of our pamphlet, appeared to be enamored with the Society of the Holy Sepulchre, which received material support from the city council to plan the events. But perhaps more worrisome for the uh, L'Avenir de Nice was the fact that these festivities did not make use of the tricolor flag, a newly minted symbol of liberal nationalism in uh, both France and Italy, opting instead for traditional colors that were uh, redolent of the ancient monarchy in that city, uh, namely the House of Savoy. Given the reactionary nature of such choices, it came as no surprise that popular participation was muted. Thus the people failed to follow the city council in illuminating its windows as a sign of collective celebration. 
And the uh, editors at Lavenir Denise noted sarcastically that this was, quote, due to gusts of wind during the day, which had, however, entirely ceased, but not before extinguishing enthusiasm at the same time as lanterns. Now, such partisanship apparently took even more extreme forms as well. It was discovered the following morning that the French consulate in Nice had been soiled with human excrement. Where Emmanuel saw a society united in its loyalty to throne and altar, the editors of L'Avenir de Nice saw a political party that sought to manipulate the masses uh, through ignorance, through superstition, and ultimately through xenophobia. But why did Catherine Seguren and her struggle against the Franco-Turks become symbols in a discursive field where competing visions of Nice vied for dominance? What were these competing visions and how were they related to contemporary developments in national identity as well as tourism? I will attempt to answer these questions by drawing on a wide range of sources, including newspapers, as well as historical writings in poetry and prose. I will try to show that the story of Catherine Seguren is, the really, is really the story of two groups of local elites negotiating a complex economic and political modernity. One group constituted to a large extent by the commercial bourgeoisie embraced this modernity along with the tourism and Francophilia that characterized it. Another group composed primarily of municipal officials like Emmanuel rejected it in favor of loyalty to the local monarchy, the House of Savoy and celebrations of Niçois particularity. The prize they competed for was the right to speak in the name of the people. But before developing this argument, it's important to construct a theoretical framework that can help us understand how economics, politics, memory, and literature were all intertwined in early 19th century Nice. And a good place to begin constructing this theoretical framework is with tourism itself. Now, a central component of tourism is the conscious effort of tourists to forget the everyday world in which they live. Hence, in English, the word vacation, which bears a very close resemblance to the word vacate, a sort of notion of emptiness. Now, this effort of forgetting, when combined with travel to distant locations, allows for the creation of an arena of myth and fantasy. As sociologist John Uri has argued, the tourist gaze, quote, in any historical period is constructed in relationship to its opposite, to non-tourist forms of social experience and consciousness, what makes a particular tourist gaze depends upon what it is contrasted with. Now, the everyday world for Northern European tourists in the early 19th century was characterized by an urban modernity that appeared increasingly threatening in social, political, and medical terms. These tourists were overwhelmingly from large cities like London and Paris that were growing at alarming rates and started to seem like dens of iniquity. Thus, the tourist gaze during this period uh, tended towards the romantic. It celebrated the social and medical virtues associated with nature as the latter supposedly, quote, cured feebleness of both body and will, daunted to mescence in particular, and sexual desire in general, while also making men manlier. Similarly, it sought out a distant past that was purged of modern threats like social strife and political conflict, presenting instead the image of a harmonious society where legal hierarchies still prevailed. In short, the tourist gaze was in search of authenticity and stability in what was perceived as an inauthentic and unstable world. A tourism in early 19th century Nice was therefore founded on remembering a past that had been so sanitized and idealized that it bordered on fantasy. The sanitization can be conceptualized as a sort of violence that shared similarities with the study of folklore that emerged in the same period. The philosopher Michel de Certeau has argued that interest in folklore and popular culture more generally begins with an act of political violence that suppresses working class movements and appropriates their culture in the name of science. Anything that it cannot account for is expunged as extraneous and irrational. These things tend to be characteristics considered incongruous with bourgeois morality. Now, in the case of Nice, it was not political but commercial violence that drove this appropriation and purging of popular culture and the past of Nice. The history of Nice was tailored to the tourist gaze in the interest of profit on the order of 10 million francs per year by the 1850s, 
roughly 110 million US dollars today. Now for this, and this profit, it should be noted, relied first and foremost on whitewashing the city, whitewashing aspects of its popular culture, transforming the Niswa into timeless stereotypes, ranging from languid orientals to, pas to virtuous pastorals, whose way of life represented the authenticity and stability that tourists sought out. Yet not all Niswa were complicit in this commercial violence. Some of them resisted it by cultivating and reappropriating those aspects of popular culture that had been purged by tourism. The story of Catherine Seguren was an important part of this resistance. For this reason, it can be interpreted as one of the many invented traditions that originated in the 19th century, according to historian Eric Hobsbawm. Confronted with the challenges posed by things like mass politics and capitalism, some elites endeavored to establish continuities with a past that seemed to be slipping away. Now, unfortunately, Hobsbawm does not leave much room for interpreting invented traditions as sites of contestation, since he focuses almost exclusively on their conservative nature. However, other scholars like Stefan Gerson have picked up where he left off by showing how different political persuasions developed different rituals that were in direct conflict with each other. Now that we have constructed the theoretical framework, we can proceed by uh, taking a look at uh, the sort of history of this Niswa heroine and how stories about Catherine Seguren became wrapped up with broader economic and political struggles. Now, the first thing that we need to do is create a timeline in order to pinpoint in which context she was most commonly mentioned. A Google Ngram searches allow us to trace changes over time in the four major languages that saw literature produced on Nice during the 18th and 19th centuries, namely German, Italian, French, and English. Interestingly enough, no results emerge from an investigation of German language texts. As for the other three languages, the results are very telling. Perhaps the most important piece of information to emerge from these searches is the incredible disparity in scale between the different language corpuses. Works written in Italian mention Catherine Seguren at a rate that far surpasses uh, that found in either French or English. Now, granted, uh, there is a period briefly at the beginning of the 19th century when the rate in French is comparable, but it ceases by the 1830s. And along this line, um, I'll go ahead and share my screen with you briefly just to show uh, an image of this n-gram graph. You can see quite dramatically the difference in scale uh, between the language corpuses. Italian here is in blue with French and English considerably uh, smaller, needless to say. Now, another significant result produced by these searches with the Google engrams is a series of peaks and troughs that characterize the Italian corpus. There is a surge in the rate of mentions during the first French empire, followed by a collapse during the restoration of the House of Savoy in 1815, with things picking up once again in the 1820s, and the upward trend really continues until the 1840s. At that point, there is a drop-off followed by a surge of unparalleled proportions that reaches its climax in the 1860s. As for the final decades of the 19th century, they witness a steady decrease until the rate of mention becomes almost negligible. Now, it's difficult to assess the meaning of all these peaks and troughs, but it can be asserted with a great deal of confidence that between 1820 and 1860, uh, those four decades were really a golden age for the story of Catherine Seguren. But why? What were those writing about Catherine Seguren responding to, and what did they hope to accomplish by inventing traditions surrounding her? Among the scholars who have thought about these issues, the answers typically are that contemporaries were responding to shifting national identities in Nice and attempting to reaffirm the Italian destiny of the city in the face of growing French sympathies. This argument contains a great deal of truth. There is considerable contemporary evidence that confirms the centrality of Catherine Seguren as a symbol of pro-Italian political parties in Nice. Now, one especially interesting piece of evidence comes from the fate of a lithograph published by Ernest Toselli in 1861. It shows a statue of Catherine Seguren framed by Andre Massena and Giuseppe Garibaldi, and it became known as the Allegoria dell'Italianità di Nizza, the allegory of the Italianness of Nice in the Italian-speaking world. And a version an annotated with patriotic Italian poetry can still be found in the National Museum of the Risorgimento in Italy. 
This argument is further reinforced by the works of romantic poets like Agat Sophie Sacerno, uh, who wrote uh, one poem called The Camp in 1848. It summons a series of guiding spirits whose glorious actions are to serve as inspiration for contemporary Italian patriots. Uh, among them is Catherine Seguren, who is supposedly uniquely qualified, quote, to animate our soldiers with the light of your soul, because your arm in breaking the crescent and lilies conserved Italy for the love of her sons. Finally, this argument fits well with the chronological trends that we saw in the Google Ngram. It will be remembered that there was a surge in the number of mentions around 1860. That is the year that witnessed the definitive annexation of Nice by France. But as is commonly the case with historical consensus, this interpretation presents only partial truths. If we accept that Catherine Seguren served as a symbol for Italian identity, how can we account for the increase in mentions during the two decades between 1820 and 1840, which preceded the widespread presence of either French sympathies or Italian nationalism in Nice? Moreover, what if debates regarding national identity in succeeding years were not rooted solely in language and history, but included economics and industry as well? It turns out that scholars have increasingly recognized the mixed nature of these debates. Arguments based on the uh, French characteristics of the Niçois dialect and the violation of local privileges by the House of Savoy were frequently paired with grievances related to inadequate support for maritime trade and tourism in the city. By extension, responses to these arguments by Italian nationalists not only refuted cultural connections with French provinces and perceived affronts from the monarchy, but denounce the deceptive charms of commercial promises made by France. This is borne out on the one hand by an August 1859 article published by L'Avenir de Nice, that opposition newspaper, which began with praise for the recent concession of a railway line connecting the city of Toulon to the River Var. It predicted a golden age for the region uh, around Nice, since such modern means of transportation would connect Nice to every industrialized Northern European country. As a result, there would be an increase in the value of our real estate because, quote, everyone knows that nine tenths of our winter colony is formed by the English, French, Germans, and Russians. It then contrasted these favorable prospects with the broken promises for a transalpine railroad made by the House of Savoy that seemed content with letting this important industry of tourism wither and die. The long-term solution for Lavinaire de Nice seemed obvious for Nice. Uh, nice sees its commerce and industry, quote, constrained by a circle of mountains and customs, which without removing the respect and affection, the Niçois owe the, their loyal king, make them inevitably turn their gaze elsewhere, end quote. On the other hand, Italian nationalists, none so famous as the native son of Nice, Giuseppe Garibaldi, Frequently David, condemned. Sorry to interrupt you. Are you uh, close to wrapping yes, up? Yes, I'm, so I'm, I'm wrapping up right now. All right, perfect. Thank you. Uh, on the other hand, Italian nationalists like the native son of Nice, Giuseppe Garibaldi, frequently condemned French sympathies and the commercial promises of tourism in the same breath. As the latter put it in his autobiography, Nice, once virile and courageous, had fallen under the corrupting sway of France and foreign tourists becoming, quote, by the depravity imported from abroad, the cosmopolitan seat of every kind of corruption, end quote. Consequently, if we accept that Catherine Seguren served as a symbol for pro-Italian political parties, we must also accept that she was arrayed against not only linguistic and historical claims, but also an economic modernity embodied by tourism and associated above all with the looming presence of France and French annexation of Nice. So with that, I will end my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, three very interesting papers. Um, do we have any questions? We have about 10 minutes for uh, discussion. All right, I'll, I'll jump in with a question then. Uh, and this one is um, 
for uh, Shivangi mainly, but um, well, yeah, this is this is a question for Shivangi. Um, so you mentioned that uh, you, you brought up um, uh, Homi Baba, right? And the uh, mimic and and this question of mimicry with the difference. Uh, how do you see that? How do you see that translated into this sort of neo-colonial context? Or have you thought about that at all? Uh, you know, when Delhi is sort of trying to mimic this world-class, uh, you know, planning uh, structure. Yeah. How how does that does that translate at all into this new context? Yeah, uh, see, uh, the mimicry, like, um, there was a portion that I have, I wrote in my paper, but because of the time constraint, I omitted that part. So when I was discussing about um, the, uh, when I was discussing the novel, The White Tiger by Adika, so in that novel, he focuses on the city of Gurgaon. So the center of action in uh, The White Tiger is Gurgaon and Delhi. And Gurgaon is often called as an Americanized city. So the, the idea when the Gurgaon was being developed, so it was seen as, okay, a perfect uh, American city that India is going to replicate. So this idea of neo-colonial, uh, uh, neo-colonial perspective in cities is seen in uh, these develop, new develop, developing cities of uh, Gurgaon and other neighboring cities which are part of uh, Delhi NCR, so Gurgaon, Noida. So they develop with the idea that we need a broad roads, we need high rising buildings. And in, in this, uh, in a way of copying the Western modernity, we are in a way, uh, I don't know if I can say into the trap of uh, uh, the Western modern, like, the uh, colonial countries, uh, like the post-colonial countries are in a way falling into the trap of Western modernity, like when they are trying to mimic their development practices or their idea of what a developed city should be. So uh, there is a certain ideas of neo-colonialism present in the novel, uh, though I didn't discuss it in the paper in a much uh, deeper way. Thank you. And this is an observation for uh, David Mook. I really loved the way you elaborated the role of memory in uh, uh, making this, uh, the tourist place like Nice uh, so significant. And also the one word uh, I had been using, but uh, didn't look at it that way, vacation. Huh? Going back to the root verb, huh? Huh? vacate. Yeah, we, we vacate the place uh, and we go to some other place when uh, when we make use of vacation yeah uh, we have been using vacations but uh, uh, your use made me think about that yeah thank you for that yeah yeah sure my pleasure yeah and something more for dr mitra yeah uh, i could go through your paper yeah and uh, <laughs> dunya uh, mm. That very word uh, made me made me go through it. Uh, I've especially worked in uh, city as kaleidoscope Indian English poetry in plural context, focusing mainly on Kolkata, uh, Mumbai, and uh, Delhi, especially through poems, not through novels. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll I'll email you. We should have a conversation. But yeah, um... yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I would be happy. Uh, yeah, you. Thank you, ma'am. Do you guys have, uh, does anyone else have more questions? Yeah. Uh, if not, I can, I can sort of try to, uh, you know, sort of think with uh, David a little bit. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the threatening response that you talk about, right, to uh, those extraneous and, uh, uh, you know, those who don't belong to the city, um, well, no, let, let, let me let me rephrase this. Have you, I mean, I was, when I was, when I was uh, reading, when I was hearing you talk, I was thinking about Ernst Renan and, uh, you know, forgetting and the nation as well, right? Um, yeah, and this question of, uh, the question of, uh, you know, tourists looking for authenticity, this is more of a comment, I guess, made me think about, uh, you know, tourists uh, going to the uh, Pacific Islands and seeing it as a kind of vacant place, right? It's not so much that you vacate your own place, but that, you know, you sort of go to this vacant place that you can then fill with your fantasies, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, so and in, I, many ways, I, in many ways, Nice functioned in precisely that way. 
Um, mm. Of course, you know, with Pacific Islands, just as with, you know, a city on the Mediterranean, even a small one or a small village, uh, one can, you know, project a desire, um, you know, for a vacated space that one can fill with one's myths and fantasies. The fact of the matter is there are always things there already, including very often at least a group of people of some kind. Yeah. Um, and this is, you know, the violence aspect, right? How do you, how do you vacate that land and vacate popular culture and aspects of the history um, that don't fit into your fantasies and don't fit into your mythologies, right? Uh, so on the part of, you know, one group of these local elites, the kind of commercial bourgeoisie, this takes the form of removing certain threatening things, uh, certain threatening aspects, uh, in particular, this myth of, of Catherine Seguren, she is, uh, you know, very, uh, very much as, you know, by, by these sort of commercial bourgeois people, uh, you know, very much denigrated. And, and in fact, her existence is even denied. She is, she is basically just uh, made into, you know, some kind of like little children's nursery rhyme uh, that, you know, has no basis in historical reality. Uh, and yet, on the other hand, you have this sort of competing group of the local elites, the municipal officials, who threatened both by, you know, the changes in their city for economic reasons uh, brought about by tourism, uh, but also threatened by the sort of French presence that seems to be lurking behind this new industry, feel very threatened and therefore in turn kind of reappropriate, rediscover and reappropriate Catherine Seguren in this sort of oppositional way. And this is kind of the mm -hmm. idea of, you know, uh, certainly translation and translation uh, as competing visions mm -hmm. of a fractured city. Yeah, absolutely. I was also struck by Barbarossa who disappears, right? I mean, the figure of Barbarossa, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, just briefly, uh, you know, is also the site of contestation, I guess, right? Because there is this whole idea of it did the Ottomans uh, side with the Tus side of the Tuscans or side with the mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. French. Interestingly uh, enough, though, yeah. um, and then certainly I didn't have uh, time to speak about this today. The, the the significance of the Ottomans more so is a way of, you know, this is part of the broader project, uh, is a way of reversing some of the kind of violence that uh, locals feel, right? One of the ways that, um, you know, the space of Nice, a tourist place is vacated, uh, is, is, is purged of threatening elements, is mm -hmm. through the creation uh, of, of timeless stereotypes, right? To which the Nice are supposed to conform, uh, whether it be the languid oriental or the uh, virtuous pastoral. And so with the Turks, um, there's this very convenient sort of rhetorical uh, opportunity to reverse the accusation. Yeah. And so you were allied with the languid Orientals, right? Whereas we were sort of the virtuous, virile warriors mm -hmm. defending ourselves. <laughs> but that's, yeah, you know, that's a, a whole other issue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I just found that that reversal, as you say, uh, extremely uh, indicative, I guess, again, of, of you know, the uh, post-colonial reading that you were mm -hmm. doing yeah um do we have any more questions i feel like yeah go ahead uh, I have for David, um, yeah, only two presenters left, so yeah, uh, it was a very good presentation, though it was a new area for me. Uh, what I could understand from the paper is that uh, you, in a way, talked about how tourism acts as an endeavor by the administration to uh, project the city in the, in the way they want to showcase uh, their policies and their ideas. So... Uh, of uh, the way like you talked about the politics between the Italy and France and how that politics was working in the tourism sector of the city of Nice. Uh, I was reminded of this idea like how every country tries to uh, showcase one of the city, uh, the tourist place uh, that can in a way project um, the uh, like the romanticized image of a city and in a way support their narrative, support the narrative of the ruling party or the ruling government. And uh, but when you go inside, like as a tourist, when you visit that particular city and you go into the depths of the city where the local people inhabit, so you start seeing uh, uh, new voices that are present. So away from the facade of a tourist city, you start encountering uh, the 
popular culture like the street art or graffiti art uh, how people often uh, present a different voice from the tourists like the inhabitants of a tourist city many a times gives different idea of the city as compared to the projected image of the city of a tourist city mm -hmm. yeah. oh absolutely and uh, perhaps this is a good place to conclude that's um you know something that is very much related to um uh, Lefebvre's work, Henri Lefebvre. Not many people know this, but um, Henri Lefebvre was particularly fascinated by the tourist city, which he referred to as um, the contradictory city, the contradictory space par excellence, um, precisely because um, tourism, like so many other kind of uh, moments of, of radical change, uh, brings about a breaking, a fracturing. Uh, it brings about a breaking, a fracturing, uh, you know, between classes, between geographical spaces, uh, creates a very segregated city uh, frequently. And um, this is, you know, one of the mechanisms of, you know, purging a local place of the things that are seen as threatening. You um, exclude them, you know, geographically as well as culturally. Uh, through the creation of, of, of ghettos and slums. In the case of Nice, that, that ghetto or slum was actually uh, the old town. It was the center of the city, uh, which is uh, not often the case. Right. Yeah, it's sort of the opposite in Delhi, where the central uh, uh, place is sort of trying to clear out uh, and then trying to create a new, new version of itself. Yeah. All right. Um, did you have more questions, uh, David or Shivangi? Did you have any questions for each other? I know we're out of, we're sort of <laughs> beyond time here, but uh, uh, yeah, we thank you very much. And um, yeah, I wish Giuseppe had stayed around because I'm sure he would have had more to, you know, uh, speak to your paper, David, because I'm not uh, too familiar with your piece either. <laughs> um, all right. Um, Thank you then, thank you uh, speakers. And um, yeah, it was very nice meeting you. It was a very yeah. good session. Thank you. Thank you.